today we're going to be talking about assignments of benefits. This is a super important question these days in uh, modern restoration. And my name is Ed Cross. I represent restoration contractors. I'm an attorney and I am also a restoration advocate for the Restoration Industry Association, but I'm coming to you today on my personal, personal Facebook page so that we can, uh, we can talk about assignments of benefits today with Mr. Whitney Wiseman. So let's start with the basics. What is an assignment of benefits? Well, lots of different kinds of rights can be assigned. An assignment is simply a transfer of legal ownership from one person to another, and all sorts of different rights can be transferred. Assignments are something that are very, very normal. A lot of restorers believe that they have an assignment of benefits in their contract when, in fact, what they have is a direction of payment. And just so we're clear on that, I want to make sure everybody understands the distinction between the two. When, when your contract says that the policyholder is instructing the insurance company to name you on the check, that's just a direction to pay. That's not what we're talking about today. What we're talking about today is a transfer of legal ownership of certain rights from the policyholder over to the contractor. And it will say words to the effect of, I hereby transfer ownership, I transfer title of these certain rights over to the contractor. Now, there's many different ways to put together an assignment of benefits. And there's many different rights that can be assigned. Now, we refer to them as assignments of benefits or AOBs for short, but assigning benefits is just one potential piece of this. One thing that you can assign in addition to the, the policy proceeds would be the right to go to appraisal. You can receive an assignment of the right to go to appraisal. You could receive an assignment of the policyholder's right to pursue claims against the insurance company for breach of the insurance contract or for insurance bad faith or you could have any combination of those things. And there's all different ways to do it. I am not here to say, ladies and gentlemen, <clears throat> that everybody should have an assignment of benefits. This is an individual decision that needs to be made on a case-by-case -case basis. And you determine in, in consultation with your lawyer what's going to be appropriate for you. But the reason my clients over the years have found that assignments are so powerful for them is because it allows them to step into the shoes of the policyholder and deal directly with the insurance company. That's a peer-to-peer, professional-to-professional uh, type of communication that takes place. And when you have those kinds of rights, then you can enforce them and you can take steps to try to encourage the insurance company to comply with its obligations under the terms of the policy. Now, we see assignments all over the place. When you go to a doctor's office, if you have health insurance, you sign an assignment of benefits so that your doctor can bill the medical insurance company directly. That's a convenience, at least for me. I'd rather not deal with the doctor's billing and all of that stuff. I don't want to have to chase the insurance company for that money. When you hire a realtor to sell a home for you on a commission basis, you are assigning to the realtor a portion of those proceeds and that constitutes the commission. Lending institutions use uh, assignments all over the place. If you were like me, you, uh, you had student loans when you went to college and you may have gotten a notice like I did that your loan had been sold to another company and now it's ABC company. I send my student loan debts back when I had them to ABC company because they've instructed me to do that. Doesn't matter a hill of beans to me whether I'm sending it to the XYZ company or the ABC company, it's just a debt, all right? So these debts can be freely transferable. Well, why do we really want to have an assignment of benefits in the 
property damage, insurance, repair industry. Well, there's a couple of reasons for it. The, the biggest one is because unfortunately, sometimes policyholders will take the insurance policy benefits and they'll run off with it. And they enjoy the benefits of your hard work. Plus also they've got the benefit of the cash and that's not a fair result. So what we do is we give the insurance company notice that an assignment has been made and the payment should be made to the restoration company. And if they fail to do that, we force the insurance company to pay a second time. This is real. This happens with some frequency. There are restoration contractors all over the country, good, reputable companies, large companies, small companies, companies with all different business philosophies that employ these assignments of benefits. And I I know for a fact that thousands of jobs are signed up in this country every single month using an assignment of benefits. Now, the other big thing that we like about them is that if the insurance company comes forward and says, we don't pay anything more than Xactimate prices, or we don't cover overhead and profit for mitigation, or they are unreasonably delaying the claim, or they are acting in bad faith somehow. Well, by virtue of the assignment of benefits, we can actually pursue a claim directly against the insurance company to prosecute those rights in situations where the policyholder doesn't have the wherewithal or the resources or the energy to pursue that. Restoration companies are often better equipped to do that. Well, There was a lot of controversy in this particular industry regarding assignments of benefits because of a really weird law that used to exist in the state of Florida. And what that law said was that if somebody holds an assignment of benefits and they go and collect money from an insurance company, they are entitled to their attorney's fees that they incur in the process of collecting on that claim. That's all they had to do was to collect on that claim and they would get an award of of attorney's fees. And unfortunately, a bunch of restoration contractors said, hey, if we're going to get our attorney's fees awarded for any recovery, why not send every claim to uh, an attorney? And we had this incredible rash of lawsuits and that was a problem. That law was unique to Florida. That law does not exist anywhere else. That law was changed. That law has been off the books and that problem was rectified two years ago. But unfortunately, in some circles, an assignment of benefits has gotten a bad rap because people have this negative impression. It's because of a weird law that used to exist in Florida and it has since been changed. The bottom line is assignments of benefits are not for everyone. Do not use an assignment of benefits if it is prohibited by a contract that you have entered. For example, um, if you're on a TPA program that prohibits it or an insurance company preferred vendor program, or uh, you are a franchisee and the franchisor prohibits it. But if your adjusters don't adjust your prices and your customers don't run off with your insurance proceeds, then I see no reason for an AOB. But hundreds of companies are using them. I've been refining my assignments for about 20 years. I'm always looking for a way to build a better mousetrap and to improve it as, as best I can. And when I talk to restorers that don't have assignments, I ask them why not. And most of them say they don't really understand how they work. So I put out a book a couple of months ago on the assignment of benefits and the Restoration Industry Association will be launching at its annual convention, a 50 state reference guide to the assignment of benefits laws, as well as insurance bad faith laws. And this is going to be a very valuable tool. And on June 29th, we are unrolling the first session of the AGA Academy. The AGA Academy is where we teach restorers how to use the advocacy tools that have been created by the Advocacy and Government Affairs Committee. And this is going to be a terrific thing because, as you may know, the AGA has put out position statements, it's put out videos, it's put out a TPA scorecard and a TPA report and all these other materials. But how do you use those? Well, the AGA Academy gives you the nuts and bolts, walks you through the step-by-step process of how to use those in your daily business. And we're very excited about that.
Well, today I'm joined here today by Mr. Whitney Wiseman of NORP, who has been very vocal about AOBs. And I had a good conversation with him about this yesterday, and I thought it would be a good idea for us to go on Facebook Live so everybody could watch as we have a constructive uh, dialogue about these. And I'm always looking for ways to make my AOBs better. And I know I'll learn stuff today from Whitney. And we want to make sure these AOBs are fair and that nobody gets hurt in the process. So with that lengthy introduction, I'd like to uh, welcome you, Whitney, and, and thank you for joining me here today. And a lot of, of you uh, know who Whitney is. And uh, first off, Whitney, for those who are not familiar with NORP, uh, would you please... Um, give people a little introduction as to what NORP is. Uh, NORP is the National Organization of Restoration and Remediation Professionals. Um, we were founded about eh, say three and a half years ago or so, so we're, we're very much so new. Uh, but we were grown out of a need and a necessity within the industry for change. Um, uh -huh. Is a lot of a trade association? Uh, yes, of sorts. I mean, we're not, you know, we're, uh, when we started this, we definitely made sure we did a lot of research looking at the different groups, um, mission statements, mm -hmm. obviously the published mission statements at the time back three years ago. Um, and we made sure that we were basically putting ourselves in an alignment to be able to uh, more or less assist in any way that we could in helping any of these changes happen. Mm -hmm. um, it seemed at that point in time that, you know, we were getting good growth. A lot of people were able to voice their opinion. Uh, the platform is very much so set up so that anybody can either voice their opinion, ask a question, reach out to anybody. Uh, so good. it's a great network for professionals to communicate with each other. Um, we have a members side of things and we obviously have a free member base. And uh, essentially, we're just set up to support the average restorer and help guide them through um, the hurdles that could be you know, finding their way through our industry. There's a lot of politics. A lot of Does politics. NERP do training? We do no training. All we do is basically help to promote the training that exists in the industry. So um, in the past, we've brought in a lot of IICRC educators in those classes and put them in front of some of our members at discounted rates. Uh, we held the road to the masters. So we held a lot of the hard to get classes that basically you got to fly all over the country to get. We did it all in a seven day period of time in one location. And we were able to get a bunch of people wrapped up in that period. So we're all about pushing the education that already exists. We have no intention of creating any sort of new uh, new way of doing anything. There's there's plenty of experts out there that are already mm -hmm. making the right decisions and guiding mm -hmm. us forward there. Good. Does NORP have an upcoming convention you'd like to plug? Uh, we're planning in, it's either going to be, it's likely going to be end of February, beginning of March, 2022. Okay. 20, yeah, 2022. All right. Wow. Crazy. So um, we've got some restorers who are saying that, uh, and AOB helps them to uh, provide better customer service because they're able to start work immediately. In other words, they're taking it as security in consideration for the fact that they are not getting immediate payment up front uh, for their restoration services because they're relying on insurance companies. Do you have any problem with that concept? I mean, everybody has their own way of uh, essentially associating their a concept of a deposit or security into starting a project. A lot of the professionals that I work with, you know, we obviously, uh, we get started, we go in and we start communicating with the insurance companies right away. And we start dealing with um, the clients, whether they're going to be self-pay, whether they're going to be uh, claims submitted and obviously going through the steps that way. Um, never really looked at the AOB personally as security. Um, <clears throat> it was brought into the state of Florida early. We never used it, never had trouble getting paid. Most all of our claims on average are closed between 14 and 20 days. So it's pretty good. You, if you document everything properly, it's pretty easy to get paid. You don't usually have those issues. Okay. Uh, well, I speak to a lot of contractors who tell a very different story that say it's not easy uh, for them to get paid. And um, they look at the AOB as uh, an important opportunity to uh, try to uh, accelerate that process. Have, have you ever seen anything on an AOB uh, that you thought was uh, basically detrimental to a restoration contractor? 
the issues that are detrimental to a restoration contractor, it's not detrimental. It's the understanding of what an AOB is and what your rights are. And unfortunately, you don't get 100% of the rights. So a lot of a lot of the ideas is, is that you're going to get the whole rights, everything. You basically assign the benefits. Yes, the terminology is there. But um, with many attorneys that I've spoken with, and correct me if I'm wrong, because I'm definitely not an attorney, um, I've been told that the rights within the policyholder's hands are much more powerful than the rights in your hand, not to say the least, not to say that they're not assignable, um, but just to say that when you're dealing with that for the customer um, and a lot of the repercussions and the negative sides of the AOB will usually end up going to affect the client in the long run because a lot of those files will end up getting escalated with legal fees and things like that. And a lot of those claims, as we know, um, end up putting those people in a situation where they may not get renewed the next year, or they may be in a situation where their you know policy uh, premiums might go up the following year. So right. there's definitely some more negative effects for our clients. So we, we don't use it for that sake. There's a lot more, con- I, I, there's other ways to do it, but not to say that there aren't circumstances where an AOB would be necessary. And, and like we were discussing last night, my biggest fear is a national release of the AOB without the training being in place and without a structured s- system that is organized in order to process those claims which is what happens in all those other industries that you mentioned, like the medical field or the real estate field. I mean, any of those things and all those industries require state licenses as whether as well as other sorts of credentials and accreditations in order to be able to do what they do. So unfortunately, just the idea of it being used by the masses uh, is what scares me because that's what happened in Florida. Um, and obviously we saw where that went. So unfortunately we don't have control over everybody in the industry. We only have control over ourselves and, um, you're only as good as the guy next to you, I guess. Yeah. I mean, I don't think we're out here to try to, uh, control restorers and as to the question as to whether the rights are more powerful, <clears throat> You know, the the right of the the policyholder or somebody who is holding rights under the policy is to see to it that the insurance company pays the fair market value for the work. And that right exists, whether it's in the hands of a policyholder or if it's in the, the hands of a restoration contractor. The contract says what the contract says. The contract doesn't right. take on a different meaning when uh, an assignment of benefits takes place. And I'm right. delighted to report that of the hundreds of clients and customers that I have, uh, a, only a tiny fraction of the claims that they're handling with assignments of benefits end up in any kind of legal issue whatsoever. And I don't even see these files, let alone file lawsuits against them. And the ones where lawsuits actually get filed are, are no more than one tenth of 1%. And that's because we don't have the rule like you guys used to have uh, down there in Florida. And so, Tell me a little bit more about the negative uh, repercussions because, you know, we, I, I fine tune my assignments very, very narrowly. And, and it makes it very clear that we are not uh, seeking an assignment of additional living expenses. We're not seeking an assignment of the value of total loss content. So all of those items are excluded from our uh, assignment and we wanna make sure that it um, it's not getting abused in that way. And I think if, if it's tailored narrowly and if the contractor is trained in a proper way to use it, uh, it can be uh, a great tool. Do you agree with that? I would say if the right steps were put in place, you know, if we were to do this in a A, B, C, D, got to go through the steps, dot the I's, cross the T's, I definitely think that there's a way in which it can be put into place. And I definitely think that there are circumstances in which an AOB gets used. The problem is the introduction of the assignment of benefits prior to the introduction and or rolling out a large scale training process that is essentially accepted and or recognized by the industry as a whole versus a a committee, if you will, or a small sum of people, because obviously we're just hearing about the announcement of this now. So it's brand new. Obviously it will grow. Um, it's just one of those things where I bet you would probably write one of the best AOBs, but as soon as it goes onto somebody's computer, obviously their lawyer within their state's going to go through it and put their touches on it. 
And then the contractor is going to say, well, I don't like this clause or I don't like this clause and this and this. And, oh, I don't get this. I want that. And eventually, unfortunately, the way that the world works in our industry being a little less standardized, if you will, uh, or at least (laughs) policed when it comes to the standardization, um, we have the standards here. It's the same issue we have with a lot of things. We have the standards in place but we have to get restorers to actually follow industry standard. If you put an AOB out there and you don't have the training in place, it's just a, a matter of time before it's copy and pasted, shared on the internet, and everyone's basically turned it into whatever their version of the AOB is. And as much as yours would be amazing and maybe be work great for the stand up, you know, top 10, 5% of the industry who are going to do everything right, document everything right, for those people, it works great. Um, And I would say the reason why it works so well for your clients is because most likely a lot of the people that you associate yourself and do business with are some of the more upstanding individuals in our, in our industry, some of the better, more professional. I hope Um, so. (laughs) Hey, listen, you're involved with the RIA. There's a lot of really professional people over there. So if any of those people are your clients, I would imagine that these people are doing things properly. So the likelihood of your clients having issues is probably much, much less than other clients. Yeah. If you were to go to Florida, I'm going to use Florida as a reference, and I'm surely not going to name any names, but there is a specific law firm in Florida that was responsible for the mass majority of the creation of this whole new push, if you will. The AOB worked great before that push. It was the same thing. It was used just like you use it. There were a few lawyers who responsibly used it within the state of Florida. It's been around for a long time, and it worked well. But then it got a hold of the lawyers who wanted to make money. And when I point out lawyers, it's no no criticism to you by any means. It's just the fact that I think we all know that in your industry, there's ambulance chasers, just like in our industry, we have fire chasers. So, you know, to one hand eats the other. And at the end of the day, there's going to be people who deteriorate what could be a good thing and turn it into a really negative thing. And the reason it went so south in Florida, unfortunately, in South Florida, specifically where I live, is because, well, we have a lot of unscrupulous contractors here. It's not to say that it wouldn't be better in some regions of the country as others. But at the same time, it has that potential without the proper rollout of training and certifications. And I don't know if you want to call it a certification. Definitely not putting anything on that. But if a detailed training course to have an understanding of how to use it, where to use it, when to use it, and why you use it, all those things have to be there, which I yeah. applaud you guys for, um, you know, starting up that process and going there. It's definitely step one. But again, my fear is the disbursement of the AOB on a national level from a group as publicly noticeable as the RIA. And that scares me because there are so many issues within the industry to see this being such a focus right now, I think is... um it must be really important. And I'd like to understand that as well. Cause I mean, for me as a restorer, you know, maybe I'm just missing something, you know, maybe I'm just seeing it from the side of Florida, but um, it's really tough to see it as the most important issue we currently face, or, you know, one of those things or an end all be all, cause it definitely is not going to fix everything. If used properly hundred percent of the way, it might make life easier for some people. But I think we both know in reality that it's going to get taken advantage of. And that's just in time, you know, it'll get used right until it gets used wrong. And once it's used wrong, the States and insurance companies will do what they did in Florida and they already have the groundwork laid out and the playbook laid out. So, yeah, Um, I I have to disagree with you on that because we do not have the fee shifting laws in any other state that Florida used to have. And when that law changed in Florida two years ago, there was one law firm, which according to news reports, uh, filed 30,000 lawsuits in one year. Okay. Over AOBs. All right. We don't have 3,000 lawsuits filed nationally, I suspect, over these things, let alone 30,000 in one state. And it's because of an old rule that you had in Florida that allowed this extremely liberal uh, recovery of attorney's fees. And and it's really not the case anywhere else. And um, that's why we haven't seen moves for legislation like that in, in other states. So I'm glad you brought up the training point. And I'm glad that we're going to be addressing this on June 29th 
at the AGA Academy at the National Convention for RIA in Orlando. And we're going to be walking through all of the different right steps. And I am a student of this as much as anybody else. And I'm always looking for an opportunity to build a better mousetrap. And my AOB now is in like its 21st edition. And I'm, I'm constantly changing it and tweaking it and trying to avoid um, these kinds of uh, issues or criticisms. So let's, let's unpack it now for a second. You said, uh, if I understand you right, that it's important that they follow the right steps in doing this. What are the right steps in your mind? And this is not a standpoint of the organization. This is, as a professional restorer, this is how I approach it within my company. I just want to make sure that that's clear. And I don't think that anybody necessarily needs to do this the same way or not. But we don't use AOBs. There's been two occasions in which we were asked to. One was why a lawyer, and that job took forever to get paid. And that's one of the biggest downsides for contractors with AOBs, the time in which it takes to get paid with an AOB versus the time it takes to get paid without an AOB. But that's arguable because obviously there's carrier payment disbursement issues. Um, But the big thing is making sure that when you're using an AOB, you're doing it for a client that is the right circumstance. For us, the only client that I would ever recommend anybody do it for is a situation that I used on the phone with you the other night. If you have an elderly client who's had insurance for a long time, the coverage is there, which obviously as a restorer, we can't read unless you're an independent adjuster or an adjuster or a lawyer or have some sort of state law that allows you to in your state. In our state, we cannot read it. So we don't read policies. Usually I bring in either a attorney that I have as a friend that will read it for me, give me a uh, essentially a understanding of what it is. Um, but regardless of that, it's a client that has the coverage that's been in their house. They don't have the means to do anything. And it's essentially the way it is for a lot of people throughout the country. When the claim happens, you don't have the means to pay for a restoration company and come in there and do the work. So a lot of these people either can't do the work or don't want to because of the potential costs that they can incur. So the assignment of benefits is very helpful in these type of circumstances where you have an individual that is potentially income uh, on an income type of situation where they have, you know, whatever plan that they have for the month and they can't break from it. Those type of situations are really the only time that I really would ever recommend to any of my guys to consider the idea of using it. Obviously we don't use them personally, but it's these weird small circumstances that it's like that. There's so many ways to go around an AOB. I mean, you can use a, just using a, uh, what is it? A, um, like a partial or a partial, uh, um, what is it? The, when you sign somebody over your rights, the, uh, power of attorney, the portional power attorney or whatever you would want to call it, where it's a power attorney based off of some of the claims where you're not removing the rights to the claim to the homeowner. You're basically just able to communicate on their behalf as if you are essentially a, um, uh, excuse my lack of knowledge of special words here, but essentially you're just the the beneficiary of helping them get through it. And at the same time, as long as you have, and I'm not a lawyer, as long as you have the contract language in there and you send the proper documents to the carrier, having your name on a check, the only way somebody can cash that check is if they sign for you, which is check fraud. So a lot of times these days, people running off with the checks, I mean, I hear about that happening less and less. Some of these protection things have come into place. It happens. It's not to say that with an AOB by accident that they're not going to send a check to the homeowner by accident because that's, I hear about that happening still. You know, they accidentally send a check to the homeowner. But like you said, you can go recover and have them cut another check. So they have to pay twice. There's certain things like that provisions that you can chase. But the time it takes to get paid is the biggest downside. As soon as you, And I've talked to many people that work on both sides, guys who were in the adjusting side of things, came over to the restoration side of things to do estimating for some consulting groups and groups like that. And they spill the beans on the stuff that used to happen at all those agencies. I'm sure you've had conversations with these guys before. And there's different files, if you will, and different piles on the desk, however you want to consider it for different things, whether it's going through litigation, whether it's got an AOB or whether it's just going through the process, whether it has a PA on it. It's, I think there are better ways for the overall process of getting paid 
when you're talking about the generality of the industry that gotcha. are much safer. Go ahead. So, so we've got some uh, comments that people have posted, which have been uh, consistent with my experience, which is that they find that uh, the AOBs actually help them get paid faster. Why do you think uh, in the instances you're referring to, uh, the time to get paid was, was slower? What, what, was the, what was going on there? Well, usually by the time that you actually, so you're either getting paid or you're not getting paid. If you have an AOB and they're going to send you a check, I would say most of those times, if you're documenting the job right and you are going through the processes of checks and balances with a proper file to go to the carrier, you should get paid in around the same amount of time. I would say that that's the carrier being willing to pay a file more so than the AOB getting you paid quick. And I would say the files that don't get paid with an AOB that go to litigation are the same files that you would potentially have to have a little bit of pushback from the carriers on. Those files that take a little bit of back and forth every once in a while with them telling you that your pricing's off for labor, your this is that, or your O&P, or whatever the different arguments are, there's hundreds of them that we could go for days and days on that. <laughs> but, but, but does the AOB slow down the payment process? From, the in, from my understanding and the professionals that I've spoken with, in my region, as well as, you know, obviously there's not a lot of people throughout the country who even know what it is. So it's very select outside of Florida, people who even know what the AOB is. Um, right. So majority of the individuals who I speak with are obviously individuals who've been through this. I've just watched a huge amount of companies go out of business in our state simply because of the fact that they don't know how to do business because they relied so much on the AOB. And for some, it was a crutch. And that's another fear. It's it's you don't have I'm not talking about the RIA people. I'm talking about some of those other professionals who don't take the proper steps. They use it okay. as a crutch to get paid quick. I, I, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not following you. Does the AOB slow down the payment process? For some, I would be sure it does on any claim. And Why? I would say most likely you'd have to separate that because that's a loaded question. What? So on files that the carrier would likely pay without an AOB versus an AOB, if you remove that from the batch, and didn't count those, I would say that yes, all the files that would normally have some sort of a pushback, AOB or no AOB, those are probably gonna be the ones that end up going to litigation. If they go to litigation, it's probably gonna take longer to get paid than if you were to not go to litigation. Okay. And lawyer's fee structure, no lawyer fee structure. If, if you're a contractor and you don't get paid, you have to bring your lawyer in to do stuff. I personally right. would rather, and this is my personal opinion, I would rather use old school contracting techniques like the stuff that's in my Florida state contracting manual about placing liens on houses because most contractors or most customers understand that putting a lien or putting things in place or intentions to lien or all those different notices of the intent to lien are just provisional things that contractors have put in place for decades. And the use of some of these tools that professionals are not using these days are might be some of the reason why they're not getting paid. And we have to remember, Ed, the client is a mutual customer of the carrier and ourselves. We work for the clients. By doing the assignment of benefits, you're working for the clients, but you're not billing them anymore. You're now going direct to the carrier for your billing, which not saying the stand-up contractor is going to mess that up. I'm worried about this not so stand-up contractor, which listen, we aren't <laughs> our industry has to start taking accountability for the things that we do. We are a part of the problem and we okay. need to be a part of the solution. So what I'm hearing is that you would approve of AOBs uh, used by stand-up contractors. Am I understanding that right? I wouldn't call it stand-up contractors. I would say those who take the time and effort to go through the process of taking the right certification class, once the industry itself has deemed it to be what we need, I would say that that process, those people should be able to use it in a manner that is appropriate. And that would be the way that we would be able to control it in one way. Granted, it could still be used negatively, not to say people couldn't get a copy of their friend's contract and go use it. That'll still happen. Yeah. But at least we'll have the separation of those people aren't a part of us. Yeah. Okay. So, you know, my perspective on this is that uh, it's very important for us to get the word out. I agree with you that a lot of people don't understand the law regarding assignment of benefits. That's why the RIA is about to release a major publication on this. And we need to get the word out 
to the insurance adjusters of the world. My dream is that by the end of 2021, we will be at a point where most adjusters at major insurance companies understand that assignment of benefits are things that need to be honored. And it should not in any way slow down the processing of a claim. And if it does, it's simply because they haven't had the education. And so I, I don't think it's a good idea to hold off and just not um, you know, pursue these kinds of rights uh, for fear that the, the ignorant are not going to uh, understand how to respond to them. I mean, this, this industry needs to unite. It's one of the reasons that I'm glad that you're speaking with me today. We need to speak with a unified voice and we need to help uh, the insurance industry as well as restoration contractors understand that um, you know, they've got these rights and that this can be a very good way to help enforce the terms of the insurance policy where the insurance company is not paying fair market value. And I believe that a number of our viewers today do not experience these wonderful collections experiences that you have where your invoices are getting paid within 15 to 30 days and you're not getting adjusters adjusting your, your bills downward. If adjusters are not reducing your invoices. And if your customers are not running off with your money, uh, yeah, you probably don't need an assignment of benefits. But I don't think that's a fair representation of what a lot of restoration contractors go through, at least the hundreds of them that, that speak to me. And so, you know, we've been uh, seeing a number of comments that have been uh, popping up uh, during our our discussion here. And uh, one thing that seems to be uh, getting people's uh, attention quite a bit during the discussion is this concept of uh, misusing something. And yeah, uh, bad actors will use things uh, in a bad way sometimes. Uh, but do you, uh, do you eliminate ink pens because they could be used as a, a weapon to stab somebody. No, that's well, here, let's, let's let, not to interrupt you, but let's go into a perfect discussion with this. It's like guns, right? I was guns afraid we we're going to go there oh, real quick, real quick. Just it's a, let's, let's just touch on this for two seconds. Cause it makes a lot of sense. Guns require training, correct? Otherwise without training or proper use of these guns, they can be very dangerous. If put into the wrong hands, they can be used for the wrong thing. If we were able to control who got them and know that it was only going to the good people, we would live in a very safe world. But unfortunately, the reality of the world we live in, guns, drugs, whatever it is, the AOB is like a drug. It's a shortcut for people to not have to take all the steps. And granted, it may work for some. It may. It may work great. The problem is, is when the overwhelming whole of everybody starts using this the same way that it did in Florida. It doesn't matter about the attorney fees. So what? The attorneys will make a little bit less money. It doesn't mean that the contractors won't try to take advantage of the billing the same way because the lawyer's fees had absolutely nothing to do with the contractor's misuse of the AOB. They were two separate issues. Okay. All right. So that, that's what we I'm, I've been trying to get at here. You're concerned about it being used for the wrong thing as if it were a gun. All right. What is the wrong thing and, and how is that used? Give me give me a specific example so I understand. For some reason, there's a thought that with the assignment of benefits, you can, like you said, charge the amount of money that you think is fair and be able to get away with it because you literally just put it into a sense that made me think, OK, well, if I use the AOB, maybe I can charge twice as much for my labor and just tell them that they're going to have to deal with it. No, of course, I'm never going to do that. And it doesn't take away anything. The AOB does not bring validity to our pricing. What brings validity to our pricing is us being a specialized trade and getting accepted as such. That's what brings validity to our pricing. Like an electrician right. or a plumber, we have to be represented as a specialized trade. It doesn't matter if we have a, t a little thing in the bottom. If you want adjusters to pay us for the work that we do, they have to look at us like we're not a whole bunch of con men who are trying to take advantage of a system. And if we already have the view that we're being, listen, insurance companies look at us like we're trying to take advantage of the system without an AOB. You think that that's going to change with an AOB? Okay. So my question though is this, 
Um, is it your impression that an AOB gives a contractor the uh, ability to charge more money for the job? I don't necessarily think that the AOB does anything with pricing at all. Okay. And I don't know talked where about the, charging. You know, you talked about charging because the issue is, is a lot of people get. Yes, because a lot of people and the issue is that there's been a lot of line items that aren't justified. There's been a lot of non-documented things. People will push claims through without the proof they need to simply because they have an AOB and by the AOB, I get paid for it, even if they did the work. I think well, it'll... Wait, Go ahead. I mean, why I'm do you, not able why to do you say thoughts, by the but... AOB they get paid for it, Whitney? The the adjuster still has a job. The adjuster can still adjust the bill. They, they, no. They're only going to pay what they're agreeing to pay. I, I don't follow the logic. So if they're only going to pay what they're going to pay, then how does the AOB get make sure that I get my paycheck at all? For the two reasons that I mentioned, number Please. one is if the policyholder runs off with the money, you can get the insurance company to pay a second time. And number two, it, the contractor can use the AOB to force the insurance company to comply with the terms of the insurance policy. The fact that they have an AOB does not give them carte blanche to charge so, whatever they want. The claim, let me ask you. Hold on. Let me finish this sentence. The okay. claim is still going to get adjusted. There's a claims manager. There's a claims vice president. They're going to look at those invoices and they've got the ability to adjust those invoices just like other any other invoice. It, it doesn't do anything. To, it's, it's not like the adjusting department shuts down when an AOB comes through and, and follow all. your logic, they're going to scrutinize it even more. They will separate it and they could potentially delay it and use it as a, a term for delay. Are they going to into the future? I don't know. Has that happened in the past? Historically in the state of Florida? Yes, it has happened in the past. Will it happen in the future in other states? It very well could. And I can't predict that. But what I can say is I feel very firm in the fact that what you're saying is kind of self-contradictory in the sense that if the AOB is not going to change any of those things, then why does it matter? Why not just have a solid contract that gets you paid utilizing proper lien laws and or even having to do a partial, a partial uh, a power of attorney just on the claim itself? Because that way it doesn't remove the homeowner as right now. you don't. I don't like removing the homeowner from the rights of the policy. And by doing a a portion of whatever you want to call it, a, uh, a um, power of attorney for the specific little bit of the claim, if you have something like that. And that's what Flor uh, some contractors in Florida have switched to doing. They made it so that there was a power of attorney and they made it so that they were able to do those things. And there's also documents that the customer could sign to make sure that you have to have it as an addendum to make sure your name's on the check. And if your name's on the check, which I haven't honestly had a customer get a check without my name on it, at least, in a while. So I will say that the carriers have done pretty good with that. I'm sure it happens maybe 10% still. So the running off issue is, is, is like this much of an issue. The other issues still exist according to what you're saying with an AOB. So the AOB does really nothing but gives you the right to, like you said, if they customer runs off with your money, you get to take the money again, which I will say that that's great. That's an awesome benefit. You can't say that that's a bad thing. But outside of that, your prices are your prices. Your contract will hold you up to your prices. Most states have contractor laws that do all of these things. The assignment of benefits should be used responsibly. I just don't think that it should be put out before the training. Mm -hmm. It's the same thing that happened in Florida. Here's a thumb drive. Go use it. If you have an issue, come to me. Uh-huh. Right. Okay. So yeah, that's why I put out a book on this that explains the step-by-step -step, uh, process of how to do it. it. It's not rocket science to do this. Doctors get them all the time. And uh, you mentioned something about um, AOBs uh, being used as, as a term for delay or a reason for delay by the insurance company. That is something that's absolutely prohibited by the law of every state. It's something that's absolutely prohibited under the uh, insurance policies. Mm -hmm. And that is evidence of bad faith. And if the restoration industry doesn't stand up against insurance companies who are mishandling these claims and, and delaying them to wear That's down the, the restoration contractors, the guys need to make payroll. And I'm sure there's a lot of NORP members who are getting strung out by uh, adjusters 
who haven't paid and they use that as leverage. We know that you need to get paid on this and I'm only going to pay you 60 cents on the dollar and it's that or take it or leave it. And these guys, you know, they got to make payroll, they got to keep the lights on and they agree to it. And then what happens after that? Well, we know what happens after that. They put down in their little book, uh, John Smith in Memphis, he will cave in. So every time they, they have a John Smith invoice, they're going to try to get him to accept 60 cents on the dollar and it's a terrible thing. I am not advocating for powers of attorney and I'll tell you why. Um, in most states, to get a power of attorney, you need to have a notary present. And I certainly don't want restoration contractors showing up to properties with a notary asking somebody to- I to mean, every- Well, let's talk about that real quick. I mean, in the state of Florida, to be a restoration contractor, you're supposed to hold a state license. In order to hold a state license and do the work, you have to pull a permit. In order to pull a permit, you have to have a notary. So most every contracting company in Florida has a notary in their office. I literally have one in the other room. So that's simple. Notarizing a piece of paper is simple. And I didn't say it. Remember, let's use that very- I don't want you to misconstrue my words because it's a limited power of attorney versus a power of attorney, which still needs a notary 100%, just like my building permit application needs two notary stamps on it for some weird reason. But let me finish. At the end of the day, you just touched on something. You said that that 60%, that guy gets stuck with the 60% or 60 cents on the dollar. I just don't want to move too far before we you know, get off another subject. The 60 cents on a dollar. But you also said a minute ago, when the insurance company argues that it's not going to change the fact that you said yourself, the AOB is not going to change whether the insurance company is going to argue with you or not. So if they're still going to argue with you, then what is it going to change? You literally said okay. that a minute ago. Yeah. Okay. The, the very, very important difference is that the contractor who holds the assignment of benefits steps into the shoes of the policy holder and can pursue the rights under the contract of insurance instead of having the door slammed in their face by an adjuster who says, you know what, this is all we're going to pay and you're just going to have to deal with it. And, and this is a widespread problem across the country. The restoration contractors without assignments do not have any legal standing to go into court and prosecute an insurance company for failing to pay the fair market value of the work. Not that I want for there to be lawsuits. There are very few of these lawsuits among my clients, but the fact that you can make one of these claims gives us incredible leverage. And in almost every instance, we don't need to file a lawsuit. And I think- well, we why would we as contractors wanna take on the burden of having to take the responsibility of suing the insurance company? Because I mean the insurance policy holders don't have the energy, the resources, or the wherewithal to do I it. Mean, and, their, and their house has been fixed, Whitney. If got you're the not professionally cabinets. helping them through this process they, and walking them through this, that's part of the insurance damage they, restoration process. Ed, we don't just walk away when we say, here's your keys and it's done. I hand over the keys to many of my clients while we're still waiting to get paid from the carrier, whether it's from a final payment for some supplemental bill or whether it's that. We don't wait to turn over any work. And that's part of the process of doing restoration. And unfortunately, there's a big misunderstanding in the industry that we're supposed to get paid from the carrier prior to being able to finish the work. And I think you can agree with me that a policy is written on the right of reimbursement for costs incurred. So the individual who is either the customer who has that policy has to incur the cost for the right of reimbursement. And if you're the carrier, if you're the contractor, then you should follow the same. I mean, if you're incurring the benefits, then at that point in time, you should be also incurring the responsibility of incurring the costs for reimbursement, which in my opinion, reimbursement for cost incurred is probably the most untalked about, most important item that you could possibly discuss within the industry. And it's a tool that many contractors don't use you can take $500 and roll it over for reimbursement of costs incurred for a time period that exists until your customer's $10,000, $20,000 bills paid off. Yeah. Simply put, so, the carriers will reimburse. I, I, I appreciate your experience. I'm glad you've had the excellent experiences that you've had with your collections. I will tell you- It isn't about that, me. That, okay. The hundreds of restoration contractors who call here 
will frequently tell me some very unfortunate stories that the policyholders lose motivation to expedite the insurance claim once they've enjoyed the benefits of the work. They're in a brand new house, it's all done, and uh, they figure that the, uh, the contractor is gonna have to uh, fend for himself. They don't have the cash to pay. Most uh, property damage claims, in my opinion, the, the policyholder doesn't simply doesn't have the money to be able to pay. And everybody is relying on insurance in the process. Insurance is an incredibly important bedrock of the American economy. The whole economy, business and, and on the personal side relies on insurance, but uh, these consumers don't have the energy, the wherewithal, the money, uh, or the acumen to prosecute claims and to make sure that the contractor uh, gets paid uh, a fair market value uh, for the price. Yeah, and I don't think that I don't, and I think you said it yourself. I don't think that AOB dictates fair market value. And I don't think AOB determines the value of any contractor's worth. And I don't think that an AOB is going to do anything for me other than potentially if the customer runs off with my check, which if the customer runs off with your check, no offense, but you got bigger problems to worry about. Um, it happens but it used to happen way more than it happens now. And I think we can all attest to that. It's very rare, few and far between. Call it maybe, I'm not even going to call percentages. I did use the 50% thing. I was able to show you that, that, that document that showed you that 50% of claims from citizens that had an AOB ended up in litigation. So those were some statistics. I'll post those links into the video just so that everybody has the actual whole article. Um, yeah. So Okay. There's just some things that have been proven to be true. So a lot of the things that have been mentioned are are amazing in theory, but I, for us in Florida, call me scarred, you know, call me just that guy who's, you know, been through the ringer. Um, the last couple of years, five, six years between the state of Florida insurance lobbyists, our own lobbyists within the industry, it's been a challenging couple of years and a lot of companies have gone out of business because of the fact that they built their businesses only knowing the assignment of benefits. And those companies who built their business only knowing the assignment of benefits when the assignment of benefits was pulled out from under the rug from under them, they didn't know how to adapt. They didn't know how to build. They didn't know how to document. They didn't know how to do these things. And I'm all about that's all old news. That's old news. All it that is old news, but it's real news and it's factual. And you know what? I know. The only thing I do know that I will speak on is facts. And I'm not going to make theoretical accusations here, just assuming the fact that the AOB is going to kill the industry and all this other stuff. I've seen it happen. If I will predict this, if it does not get rolled out in the proper way, you know, cart before you know, horses before the buggy, not cart before the horse, you know, got to make sure. Cause if you put the cart before the buggy that you're going to have a problem as a chariot racer. Right. And there's a reason that that analogy is there and I'm all for it being pushed out, but I truly, truly believe that maybe it's two steps backwards before you take four steps forwards, because there's some things that need to be put in place to safeguard the restoration professionals. Those of us who truly care about, the safeguarding of our industry and the potential where our future industry will be and what it will implicate us to be. And, and all the different things that could happen from the misuse of all these things, we have to protect ourselves before it happens instead of saying, well, it could happen. Well, you know what? It could happen just as well as what you're saying could happen because you know what? These are theoretical ideas based off of what we've seen and the numbers of what you're dealing with, unfortunately, aren't enough in each state to verify or not verify how many AOBs because none of these states actually track that record. Florida was the only state that actually tracked the use of AOBs. So there's no accurate statistics in other states about the use of AOBs other than what the carriers might have in our office. So I wish I could come to you with those statistics and tell you in other states what elevation of claims went to what level because of the use of AOB versus the claims without the AOB. Because all that statistics, the state of Florida had all that stuff compiled. And thankfully, we have it in front of us here, but we don't have that information in other states. 
And if it's so apparent that it's here, and I'm, I'm not talking about the AOB in the roofing industry. I'm not talking about it in the window glass industry. I'm not talking about it in the doctor industry. I'm not talking about it in medical industry, I should say. My point is, if we want to, and I'm a restorer, like I'm not, I have no dog in this fight as far as anything other than this, the integrity of our industry and making sure that my brothers and sisters as restoration contractors, the people that I volunteer my time every day to do this type of stuff for, that they're safeguarded and protected from certain things like this being put out. I mean, I was talking to another guy, I won't use his name, but I use the analogy of it's like a pharmaceutical company, Pfizer, big one, Johnson and Johnson, whoever you want to say, saying we got the newest opiate drug and there's no chance that anybody will ever get addicted and none of your pain will ever be there. And if it doesn't work, you're going to get your money back from the doctor because Reality is, is that one of those things may can come true, but majority of them aren't going to come true. Yeah. And if we're dealing with the masses and the people in our industry who have destroyed our industry to the point where it is, which makes it challenging. And this is where we have to take accountability and police ourselves as an industry and come together, all of us professional people, through training at the IICRC, through unity with the RA, through different things with the SCRT, through wherever it is, wherever you're coming from. If you call yourself a restorer, we need to stand up, get paid for what we get paid, regardless of an AOB, be considered a specialty trading, get paid as such. I own an electrical company. I own a plumbing company and I own a general contracting company, all of which my prices for my guys that I pay them goes from 85 to 120 to 160. And those are what we charge. And I'm not going to tell you which ones because of the trade and whatever, but those are the three different categories outside of restoration. And our restoration prices in this area are horrible for labor. And yes, you can go become a level two or level three exact to make guy. And you can learn how to write an amazing detailed line item to exact to make. But guess what? You're going to use those line items. They're going to send it to the insurance carrier. And we're still dealing with, oh, your prices are too high. And we're not going to pay for this. And, oh, I mean, right now I'm dealing with a kitchen. They don't want to pay me any more than Xactimate rates on a kitchen. And I'm sitting here saying, Wood's up 300%. No, Xactimate rates, you're too high. You're right. too high. And AOB would help you in that situation. I don't think the AOB would get me more money. You know what's going to get me the money? My customer made incremental payments on the claim, and he got reimbursed each time he made a payment. And over that time period that we were doing the claim, he was able to reimburse himself for all the money that the costs incurred because, like you said, bad faith, the worst bad faith, the number one bad faith rule, if you were to say, don't break this rule, the number one, don't do it, don't do it, is paying people back, reimbursing claims for costs incurred as long as there's coverage minus deductible. Which, and that is the number one thing. Which is great if they've got the cash to pay. And the willing can you can take five hundred bucks and you can roll five hundred dollars into it. You but can roll five hundred dollars isn't gonna pay a hundred thousand dollar fire reconstruction job. If somebody has a house that caused that much damage, they likely have probably have at least a little bit of money to roll into it, whether it be a thousand dollars to roll into it or whatever. And you as a contractor can also work with them to get portions of work done and complete right. things. You can also yeah. become your own lending company and make a really? loan to the company and make it paid. I, I, I am going to ask you to take my word for it that these are not theoretical ideas, that I have the best interests of the restoration industry at heart, that I have dozens and dozens of restoration contractor clients across the country that's not in question, Ed. And I told you this last is, night. Hold on, let me let me finish. I let you finish. I and and they are enjoying good success using AOBs because it puts them in the driver's seat on these claims. It gives them the ability to legally force the insurance company to pay the usual and customary cost of the work, which is the insurance company's contractual obligation under the policy. And if yeah. they're not standing in the shoes of the policy holder, they've got no ability to do that. And so I'm, I'm very glad to hear that you support Unity through the RIA. I was glad to hear that you uh, became a member of the RIA. 
I, I want to touch on what you said about the citizen's insurance situation in Florida. That's completely moot now because the law changed in 2019 and the attorney fee shifting rule that caused all of those lawsuits is over. You refer to killing the industry and destroying the industry. I suspect that our viewers who are on today do not believe that the restoration industry has been killed or destroyed in the state of Florida or anybody else. And I'm, I agree with you that um, AOBs should be rolled out in the proper way. And I'd like you to tell us what you believe is the proper way. Well, first off, I just want to make sure none of my words get too twisted here. Um, I didn't think that it ruined the industry in the state of Florida. I simply will say that there were a lot of very shady contractors who did a lot of bad things, who made a lot of good contractors look bad. And okay, we are now carrying the fault the of the AOB. That's the fault of bad contractors, which isn't going to okay. change whether you have an AOB. And we t touched on this at all. Like you just right. said, my customers have had great success. My AOB works, my this, my that. But what I'm going to tell you is, is you're one lawyer, you have one circle of clients. And as much as those clients might be the best in the industry, which they likely could be, we still have to worry about the outliers. And the percentage, unfortunately, is far, far, far in the other favor. And that's why I think personally that yes, rolling out the training is number one, putting What's together the proper way, creating a system that is agreed upon by more than just a committee of individuals within one organization. I think that it needs to be a complete unanimous type of a deal where all involved in the industry have a seat at the table in the deciding of something that could be so pivotal, pivotal for our industry's use. Okay. And then from that point, once we design it unanimously, we can then roll out a training course or not, not us, you can roll out a training course like you already have that encompasses all of the values in which the committee has set for this. And then right. from that point in time, just like you have for the CR or any of these other things where you have a designation, you're able to add that in there as whatever name you want to call it. And then from that point forward, those individuals, as long as they follow the standards in place by this committee to use these AOBs, then by all means, they should be protected. And everybody else at that point in time, if they're using it in any other way, these individuals using it the right way would be shielded by the fact that they did this in the process. It's essentially okay. just, I, okay, go ahead. So, so could you give me a couple of specific examples of what you think is most important about this system that contractors should be trained on the proper way to use an assignment? Give me, give me some specifics. Proper use of standards within the industry. Super okay. important. Proper documentation and creation of a file to be submitted in order to get that to the to the carrier in order for a smooth transition of documentation so that there's a smooth transition of payment. Okay. W would you I'm agree a, that there's I'm already done, widespread but. training for, for standards and, and documentation? I'm sorry? W would you agree that there's already widespread training available in the industry for standards uh, of work, methods, and uh, project documentation? Not specifically and related to the processing of an AOB, no. Okay. There's no mention so, of an assignment of benefits in any of those classes. Okay. Well, it's mentioned in my classes every single time. Like I said, but, once again, this is a Ed Cross class. We have to make this an industry thing and not just an Ed Cross thing. And God, that's what we're doing on June 29, 2021 in Orlando, Florida at the Good International pitch. Restoration Convention. <laughs> you handed me that one, buddy. No, no, for <laughs> real. And I hope Ladies everyone and gets we a didn't chance rehearse to go. this. I hope everyone makes it there. I mean, I know that I yeah. will be there for sure. Um, at the end of the day, it doesn't change that if you release this in one month, I can guarantee you that there's no way that you're going to be able to have a committee that does this, that's unanimous with the industry's best industry, best interest. It's going to be like a lot of other things that have been rolled out in the past through the organization, which is a group of individuals put together a book of things and they tell people that this is our new way of doing things and you either do or you don't do it. And unfortunately, there's not enough input from the industry. And that's why 
I think NORP has so much of a importance in the industry because it's the standard restorers, the everyday restorers voice. Everybody needs a voice, not just those at the table. We all need a seat at the table. Not me, not Clark Brown, not any of these people, all of us, you know, and Clark made a good point earlier and I, I lost it. And the one thing is, is everyone should stay in their lane. So a customer who has the policy they should be their policy. And we as restorers should stay in our lane and be the contractors. We should focus on being the best contractors we, should, we would be, not being attorneys and pretending like we have some special little, whoop, I got this little special card we can pull out of our back pocket. We have to be the most professional individuals we can be and stay, like Clark said, we have to stay in our lane. And what yeah. that means is our lane, if we in my opinion, our lane, if we want to be considered specialty contractors, we always use the medical industry, right? I would consider us like heart surgeons or emergency room doctors or a lot of other specialty trades within the medical industry, because we don't just go in there and be like, oh yeah, you look good today. Okay. Temperature, your ears are this. Okay. Go ahead. Take your uh, low, your blood pressure medicine every week. That's not what we do. We go in and we assess things in emergency situations. We triage jobs. We are the specialized group. And we are part of the construction industry, just mm -hmm. like we're electricians and plumbers. And we need to be represented as such. And unfortunately, I don't think that the AOB is going to move us forward with any traction as far as us being or taking that place at the table as restoration contractors, sitting next to the plumbing contractors, sitting next to the HVAC contractors and the general contractors and all those other people, because we deserve a seat at the table. And the only way we're going to get there is by putting systems in place and holding ourselves accountable. Look in Florida. We had huge issues before 2008 because of contractors, unlicensed contractors and all this different stuff. I'm not necessarily pushing licensing or not licensing, but I'm going to tell you that having licensing and manuals, construction manuals in place and having codes and having these things in place and having groups that actually enforce these things, whether it be building departments or the industry itself, because the industry does hold itself accountable just like we do. And I think groups like the RIA, you need our support, the numbers that are a part of NORP. You need everybody to join the RIA. But the thing is, is we need to make sure that the RIA spends that money on the right things because you guys have power. But with great power comes great responsibility. And we want to make sure that you guys take the spear, go stab it in those insurance industries, little, you know, the little tweaks that they have or their little the little shortcuts that they get us and those little you don't afford to be paid this much that's what we want to attack we don't want to attack the insurance companies we want to attack their comments to us saying that you don't deserve to be paid this much that you aren't a specialized trade that this is way too much money for this or this is that my prices are my prices his prices are his prices mm -hmm. and everybody has the ability to determine their own prices hopefully by the help of their accountant and okay. unfortunately that's where I don't think the AOB, back on topic here, I don't think the AOB is going to change any of those things. Like you said, the best benefit of it is going to be the fact that if somebody runs off with my check, that I'm going to be able to get the insurance company to cut another check. But the question is, how long will it take them to cut that other check? Well, it's not going to be any slower if there's an AOB. That's, that's my position. Once they understand and the word is out about the enforceability of this, and uh, once the 50 state reference guide comes out, we're going to be a long way toward making that happen. I, I want to thank great. everybody who's putting uh, comments on. I am paying attention to the, uh, the comments. There's been a number of discussions on there about regulations, and I just want to be clear, uh, Whitney, are you recommending that there be regulations outlawing assignments for restoration contractors? No. Okay, good. I, I didn't think so. I just wanted to uh, to clarify that. The only thing that I am going to say and that I've said to you is I think that creating a system, training of that system, and then implementation of the AOB would be the three-pronged approach, in my opinion, to safeguard the industry and give us that boundary layer to separate us from those who may not use it properly. Because if you're holding the people who are using it accountable, who have this credential and you at that point in time can remove the credential for those who don't use it properly, that's how we safeguard. And I think at that point, all of your top tier professionals would probably still use it the way that they do. Cause like you said, there's great success in small numbers, but it's when it starts to be big numbers that it worries me because that's when the insurance company starts to react. Could, could you please give me an example of an improper use of an AOB? 
I mean, improper use of an AOB. You're, you're Somebody concerned about def- them being used improperly. I mean, Wait, there's a lot mean? of ways that people have basically claimed that it's been improperly used. So I'm not going to say that these are my opinions. I'll go off of, you know, what has been claimed by, say, the insurance companies on the side of things where I can say, okay, well, I've seen carrier, I've seen contractors do this with AOBs and no AOBs. Like you said, this happens AOB or no AOB. It doesn't stop a contractor from overcharging an AOB. That doesn't change anything. The downfall is individuals who are contractors forcing more claims into litigation. And by that fault, they are going to affect themselves negatively because they're going to in turn affect their customers. I try not to negatively affect my customers by basically putting them into situations that where their insurance policies could essentially be either increased in premium costs or any of that other stuff. Okay. You can talk to insurance agents. If you want to have another one of these calls, we can get an insurance agent and a lawyer who used to be a lobbyist in Washington for insurance groups. And he'll discuss with you a lot of these details yeah. that go yeah. into that because I can't go too much farther, but that's just based off of what he okay. said. So he was a major lobbyist in there. Yeah. So. so so the restoration contractors who, who use AOBs do not believe that the AOBs negatively impact the customers. Quite the opposite, as a matter of fact. If the contractor is able to collect directly from the insurance company and free the policyholder from the obligation of paying the bill, that helps the policyholder. It doesn't negatively impact the policyholder. As to the subject of premium increases, premium increases happen because of losses. All right. The fact that an AOB has uh, been signed on a project does not create a loss. All right. They are oh. going to uh, adjust their premiums or decide to cancel a policy if somebody has had uh, excessive claims. So, um, you know, uh, a number of the. I com- mean, that's a, that's your opinion. I honestly I'd say that that's definitely an opinion because I would also say that, you know, like I said, I've spoken with and this isn't my comment. This is there's an insurance professional locally in town who used to be a major lobbyist for one of the insurance carriers in Washington. That was his job. This guy knows the ins and outs of policy language because he's also an attorney. So it really helps to have both sides of the spectrum there. You're aware of, go ahead and interrupt me again. No, please. You're aware of the grading scale, which we discussed last night about how, you know, insurance claims on houses are very similar to driving records with cars in the sense that, depending on the severity of the claim and how it's processed is how the insurance, whatever you want a policy is graded. At that point in time, they go to that grade when it comes to renewals, reissuance of the um, policies, as well as determining the premium of the policy. Sometimes these factors that play into it are over like losses that the insurance company would consider to be over and above what it should have been essentially an excessive loss. If you will, they consider these to be a a negative score. Obviously a claim that is settled quickly and easily is probably the least effective on that. Then you go up if there's public adjusters are involved, obviously the, the, the policy limits are, tested on certain areas because they are obviously increasing claims by usually at the most their 10 to 20 percent fee that's how they work and then you have litigation that happens somewhere in here it was where i was explained that the aob fell into and like you said it's working now but the question is is when it stops working all these individual companies who have their processes and systems in place they're going to have to redo it. I mean, look at the lawyer in Florida. He went from being use an AOB, use an AOB, use an AOB, use an AOB to the day that that uh, the the Senate passed everything in the state and the day that the bill passed, it was don't use an AOB, don't use an AOB, don't use an AOB. But yet he's in another state using use an AOB, use an AOB. And it's just this contradictory voice of what no. is correct. Yeah, no, no, it's not. The laws vary from state to state. And that's correct. What we, are, we are outlining in our 50 state reference guide of all of the sure. different laws. And um, there are a lot of really good reasons because of that new law not to use an AOB in the state of Florida. Most notably, it is uh, one of, if not the only 
uh, state where if you get an assignment, you waive the right to recover any money from your customer. And so Florida, in my opinion, kind of went from one extreme to another. All right. It was. It so was, would you suggest to people if they have an AOB and they don't get, so say they have an assignment of benefits and they get paid 80% of the claim, do you suggest that they, A, bite the bullet on the 20% or do they go after the homeowner for the, the additional 20% that's remaining that the insurance company didn't pay that even with an assignment of benefits, they didn't, weren't able to collect because it, the assignment of benefits isn't a guarantee that you're going to collect that money. Right. No, I think that they need to make a decision based on the circumstances of the case and where they think they're most likely to get the recovery. And if they've got an assignment of benefits and the insurance company has not paid fair market value for that work, in many cases, it's easier to collect from the insurance company than it is from the customer. And that's just been the experience of me and my clients. And you have different experience. And Oh, listen, I'm not just going off of my experiences. You know, we have uh, fortunately, I'm able to spend a lot of time talking to professionals all over the country and hearing about different experiences and the drastic differences in our marketplaces that there are from Indiana to California to uh, everywhere, everywhere. The challenges with equipment procurement, the challenges with labor, the challenges with hiring and firing, the challenges with building a business, all these different things. Because every day we as a restoration contractor are faced with tons of challenges, right? So, Right, Definitely getting paid has always been one of the largest challenges that there is in the industry. And there's so many ways that it can be approached. You know, one of the things is better documentation. Obviously we all know that the industry in a whole, as a whole needs to do better documentation, right? Agreed. We as an industry need to hold ourselves to the stand. The standards are there, right? But we as an industry need to hold ourselves to the standards. You shouldn't have four contractors showing up at the same job with a completely different scope. You should have four contractors with similar training, showing up at the same job, having a similar plan of action. I mean, granted, everyone, you know, everyone can do things a little bit differently, but at the end of the day, we should all be doing things similarly. We should all be using similar equipment calculations. We should all be using similar practices and SOPs in order to make sure that we're protecting our employees. We should all be using all the different things to protect the, you know, the environments or the places where we're working. These are what we do to make ourselves more professional. What I just, really would love to know is, you know, this is great that this is coming to the attention in the forefront with the RAA. Are you all interested or are you all willing to maybe slow down the issuance of the actual assignment of benefits itself, not stopping the process, not saying anything other than, and making sure that the the proper steps are taken before we outline, like I outlined, I mean, is that something that you guys are willing to consider you to do before dispersing an assignment of benefits on a national level? I'll do you one better. At this point, RIA has no plans to disperse any assignment of benefits. But you're promoting the use of it. And if you don't disperse it, that just leaves people to the means of going and finding one elsewhere. They're either going to go to edcross.com, plug. I don't know if that's the right website. That's it. You nailed it, man. Google Ed Cross and you can find him. You got great (laughs) contracts and I love what you do. And the problem is, is like most people can think that I have a problem with you. And it's not that I have a problem with you. I have a problem with the general misuse of the assignment of benefits and the fact that you might be that one percenter, you know, call it a bike gang. You know, you're like the one percenter. You keep that thing on there. All your clients might be part of that one percent group. And unfortunately, those guys are affected more so by what you do to help them. But they're affected by the people outside of that circle who do things negatively and those are the things we need to focus on is how do we separate ourselves from not to use this inappropriate term, but from the trunk slammers and the guys who just said, man, I saw myself in exact my bill once. And that thing was amazing. I'm going to go out and get me a program, some dehumidifiers and some air movers. And I'm going to do me some work because at the end of the day, there's so many people who get into our industry simply by looking at the monetary potentials there. And that's funny because we have one post in one group saying the profit margin in our industry is 70, 80%. And then we have another group where we talk about, I can't make ends meet without 10 and 10. And I'm over here just trying to figure out where I am in between because I'm more over here. But these people, how, if if you remove the 10 and 10 from this guy's thing, he's still at 50%. That's really good. 
we're getting multiple questions here. What is the misuse? What is the abuse? I might have missed it. Frankly, Whitney, I think I missed it too. I heard you right, talk so about overpricing. Let me, talk, let me touch and, on the misuse points without us getting into each one that I touch on because what's happened is I touched on one and then you kind of dug into it a little bit. So let me just go through the points. If you want to yeah. come back and touch on those points in a minute, I think that'd be great. So the biggest thing is contractors thinking that the AOB is a blank check. Am I going to sit here and say that it is? No, the AOB is not a blank check. And I think that that's part of maybe education, right? Telling people that it's not a blank check, but unfortunately not the 10 percenters and not the one percenters because Ed Cross's guys are the best. And, and I'm not saying that sarcastically because the people that you deal with in the, your circle are some of the best in our industry. So Unfortunately, the pool you're drawing from is like pool drawing from an Olympic athlete pool where we all know that nobody does steroids, nobody's this, nobody's that. They've all walked the straight and narrow. They're the best of the best. But unfortunately, the majority of our industry is not built by those things. So that's one big issue is thinking it's a blank check. That is the biggest thing that I would say is the immediate easiest thing to call out at the end of the day. People believing that the AOB is going to, in some way, like you said, it doesn't do it, but in some way it's going to give them the ability to charge the prices that they charge, whether they document for it or not, whatever it is, what it is. As long as your prices are reasonable and customary, you should get paid regardless AOB or not AOB. You should. said, good, exactly. In a perfect world. That would in be a perfect great. world. A hundred percent. You trust adjusters more than I do. I think that's our fundamental. I don't trust the adjusters. What I've done over the last 16 years is I've learned of ways of being able to work around their weaknesses. And if you put them into situations where they have to answer questions that would put them in saying bad faith, bad faith, bad faith, using terms like reimbursement of costs incurred and all these other things, whereas it's like, so are you telling me that the customer doesn't have coverage for this? No, I'm not telling you they don't have coverage for this. I'm just telling you that the price you're trying to charge me for this is way too much, blah, 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 blah. Will you give me a dump receipt for this? No, I'm not going to give you a dump receipt. There is no standard in the industry that requires me to give you this sort of sort of analytical data. No. Okay. So right. if I sue them myself, AOB or no AOB, I'll probably have the same outcome. And I can sue as a partner because if you can work with your customers, you can pay for the litigation for your client to sue the carrier. If you're going to pay for the litigation through the AOB, then you might as well pay for the litigation through the, the client because the client, and I know you can't tell me I'm wrong with this, the client reserves more rights from that policy than you do with an assignment of benefits. And they, as the policy holder, and I'm not saying this much, may only be this much, but my point is, is that little bit matters. Every little what is that bit, bit matters. What is that, that little bit though? I don't I don't understand what part of the policy you're referring to. They, they've got to pay the usual and customary costs to repair the building after a covered claim. They're required to pay reasonable and customary prices no matter what. It's just who they're obligated to pay it to, whether they're obligated to pay it to the client. But at the end of the day, the end responsibility still falls on the homeowner because even you as a contractor, if you don't get paid by the insurance company, go back and forth as much as you want you're either going to have to determine whether you're going to let that go as a loss and write it off or whether you're going to go after the customer and you're going to try to lean their house. The yeah. problem is, is usually by that time, if you are trying to chase the AOB, your lien rights are gone by that time. And in some states, specifically Florida, you can't even lean a house if you have an assignment of benefits. And it's not right. that we lean a house because we as contractors, just for clarification, we don't lean a house. We send a notice of intent to lean to a customer within a certain amount of days with the contract value notified on that. And only reason that they would ever have an actual registered lien on the house is if we filed a lien. So this is standard contracting work. And I think if we just taught people how to be contractors, we make a few steps in the right direction. And I'm not saying don't use the AOB. All I would ask of the RIA is to just slow the release of the program so that it's set up so that whenever somebody does get a AOB from wherever they get an AOB from, if it's not getting released from there, that they have that credential, if they will, or they have that pat on the back, that nod, that, you know, the, the sword on the shoulder to be able to sit here and say that, you know what, 
you've taken the steps to be the responsible business owner that knows how to do this and understands Whitney, what the powers of an ALB are. Whitney, that's exactly what I'm going to teach them in Orlando. How this long's the class? Set up. Whitney, how long's the class? It's 75 minutes. That 75 minutes will teach everybody everything that they need to know about an assignment of benefits. It'll teach them enough that they need to know so that they don't use it in an irresponsible way. So the lawyer that went around Florida handing out thumb drives, he did it in exchange for a 60 minute lunch. So you're essentially getting 15 minute more than he did. And look at how it turned out in Florida. So my my request on behalf of all of my fellow brothers and sisters within this restoration industry would be that we take something so important as such, because obviously the RIA and yourself think that the assignment of benefits is a huge, huge tool to use as restoration contractors. And that may be so, but don't you think that it deserves more than a, a very short class? Yeah, that's why I wrote a book on the subject. That's very good, but that's okay. I won't I, I really... I, I gave an hour and a half presentation this morning through the restoration project management program. Uh, and that's through, good enough. Through, and you don't through, you think that that's no, all we need? No, no, but we're starting. We're, we're chipping away at this. So let's, it, it's not, it, you know, let's walk I, before we run. You know what I mean? Don't you think we should walk before we run? I mean, that's how you fall on your face a lot. We're, we're, we're starting the process. We're embarking on these initial steps, you know, uh, following this. Logic. I respect the initial steps, but you're literally rolling out a very short training course and a book and claiming the, obviously yourself that it's not enough. I mean, my as somebody who is just trying to be an advocate for others that are in the same industry as me, and unfortunately, you're not a contractor. You're a very successful attorney and very well respected within our industry. I have a few of those. Um, and at the end of the day, I would just ask of you to maybe put together a two day training class that okay. encompasses all of the details or even maybe even a full day I, at that least. I don't um, think anybody just, wants to listen to me talk that long. I, I'm Listen, I'm, I don't care whether somebody wants to listen to you talk that long or not. They should have to endure your your talking in order to be able to use an AOB if that's how you really feel about your own voice. I yeah. personally think that two days I would learn a lot of information from you. Yeah. And if you were to actually put together a class that did this for a day or two, I just think it's, that it deserves a little bit more than a couple hours. That's it's, all. it's not that complicated. It's simply you're talking 75, 75 minutes, though. So, right. And, you okay. know, we have a number of different topics that we need to cover at the uh, the convention, and it's not all about AOBs. We're not going to take the um, the whole uh, the whole convention and dedicate it just to that. So what I'm holding here is a document that everybody's familiar with. It's it's the S500 and we don't it's an old version. Yeah, I was about <laughs> to say it looks a little outdated. Yeah, this is this is the second edition. I was involved in Ooh. editing this. You should and frame that. It, yeah, yeah, I should. And, um, we don't look at this and say, you know what? I'm not going to look at this because it's not enough. I need more. We start with this. We read this. We take classes. We watch videos. We do a bunch of things. It's all part of a process. I, I'm not saying that uh, what we're doing in Florida is the be all end all, but I am, I am questioning your critique of a program that you haven't seen that you know nothing about. I'm not critiquing the program. I'm simply stating that it's extremely similar to the same program that a lawyer rolled out in Florida, 15 minute longer to be exact. He's written a book as well, I believe. Many papers and stuff on all this stuff. He talks all the time on this stuff. It just seems very much so eerily, very much so eerily familiar of the path in which I remember him going down. And I remember standing in a hallway with this gentleman and I'm going to tell you this is I stood there in the hallway with him when I was teaching for the state licensing for Florida. It was at one of our classes. He was about to go in for the lunch. And I said, so-and-so, if you could, please, man, just don't go handing this stuff out like this. Please put together some sort of training and education. You can charge for it. I'm sure people would pay for it. And you know what happened? He said, no, no, I, I use it already. People do it. It's working. Getting people paid, getting people paid. I'm getting all my customers paid. And you know what? That guy that I'm talking about is pretty sure is the attorney that ran the law firm that you mentioned that had 30,000 claims. Might right. not have been him, but it was close yeah, but, to it. And Whitney. it's a very similar. So 
Whitney. forgive me if I'm a little bit scared because I kind of right. see Groundhog Day. You know, they, they're pulling the guy out of the box again. And I'm just like, oh, God. Oh, God. Yeah. Is this but, about to happen again? Because I literally just lived it in Florida. So you have to understand yeah. my hesitation. Right. I'm like, holy right. crap. Is this happening again? Yeah. And the reason it happened there was because of a bad law that got changed. It wasn't a bad law. The bad law got put in place after the AOB was being misused. The AOB had been misused in the state of Florida for years. And I'm not going to sit here and talk about how it was misused. You can go Google Florida AOB misuse and you can get as many, there are plenty of articles. You can get both sides of the story. You can go and read it from those who support the assignment of benefits and those who don't support the assignment of benefits. The fact is, is those laws weren't always there. And unfortunately, the only law that you keep mentioning is the the attorney payment provision, which has absolutely nothing to do with the recover of the recoverable ability of the AOB. That just has to do with how much a lawyer gets paid. I'm not talking about the lawyer getting paid things. So let's put that aside. I'm talking about the fact that the AOB and the way that it's being proposed to be put out now by you all is literally a carbon copy plus 15 minutes of what and how it was rolled out in the state of Florida. And I really hope that you're not going to give a thumb drive or any of that kind of stuff with it, because then it would be way too Groundhog's Day for me. Respectfully, you haven't seen the program and you're in no position to make that that say I would love so, to see it. So, but so it's, you, you will. So um, I, I want to go back. I don't want to ignore what the listen, viewers are uh, saying. Let me just stop real quick. I just want to make sure one thing. I wasn't saying anything about your program. I was saying from what you've told me so far, what you've said, and I'd be more than happy to hear more, is very much so similar to exactly what had happened in the past, historically, right. in the state of Florida. Yeah. And I think by doing so, I don't think I'm judging what you guys are trying to roll out. I think professionally, I'm just simply relating the fact that the two of them are kind of in line. That's yeah. all that I'm saying. Yeah. That's it. I'm not making but, any other assumptions other than that. But go ahead. But but the problems that happened in the state of Florida were because it had a bad law and that law doesn't exist anymore. And okay. it doesn't so, exist anywhere else in the country. That's that's old news from two years. Can I ago. ask a question oh. on that point? OK, please. If that is not allowed in Florida thing happen, are you going to say, are you willing to say that what happened in Florida can't happen in any other state? There is no law that I have looked at. And no, I'm, I'm not talking about law that you've looked at in any other state. I'm saying, is it not possible for any other of the 49 states in the United States to essentially take motions in the future in order to counteract the use of assignment of benefits once they start being used on a more uh, regular basis. Is Uh, it not possible for other states to put in line the same sort of legislation to block these things? Is that possible? Are are you asking if there's a possibility that the insurance industry is going to try to put in legislation in other states regarding assignments of benefits? Because if that's the question, you made a comment stating that Florida had its unique issue and it's very unique to Florida. Right. What I'm saying is, is I think that that could happen in other states. So what I'm asking you is, is it no. not, not because of the lawyer fees? You're is not, it not you're, possible? You're not, not understanding the past litigation. Is it not possible for other states to react to the AOB in the same way? And I'm not talking about insurance companies, I'm talking about state legislature. Is it not possible for state legislature to move forward the same way with assignment of benefits as Florida did in other states? Is that possible? The, the nature of the law in Florida encouraged thousands of lawsuits to be filed. Once that got changed, the lawsuits stopped. Okay. Okay. So in, what you're saying large, is, is that it's not part. possible to happen in other states for the state statutes to be changed the way that they were changed in the state of Florida. It's not possible. No, they're already like it is in the state of Florida with respect to there being no attorney fee shifting in many. I'm not talking about the attorney fee. I don't know why we keep coming back to the attorney fee. The the attorney fee doesn't have anything to do with restorers and we're restoration contractors. You're representing restoration contractors. I'm glad. I just want to ask you, you've asked me a lot of questions that I'm just hoping that I can ask you one very fair question. I don't think it's a big question. It's simply asking you, is it not possible for states 
other states, Georgia, Mississippi, Louisiana, New York, whatever it is, whoever they are, whatever their current laws are now, is it not possible for them in the next year or two to react and make reactive changes to their legislature and their whatever laws in the same fashion in which Florida did, not in regards to legal fees, because I don't care about lawyer fees. Do you know how little I care? I don't even know what the okay. lawyers make off the AOBs. I care about how it affects right. the they're, restoration contractor. I don't know why we keep talking about the legal. They're, fees. they're, they're asking you to let me speak. Okay. So if you please. would indulge me, I would, I would appreciate that. All Just right. Please answer the question. That's all I can ask. Okay. I, I, I'm understanding you to be asking if, it's possible for the insurance industry to attempt to bring legislation in other states to control and regulate uh, assignments of benefits. And of course, the answer is yes. But the circumstances in those other states are dramatically different from what we had in Florida because of the Florida attorney fee rule. Okay. Right. That, that the fair enough, fair enough. You answered my question, regardless of why you answered my question. So that's the fear is that if other states could use what Florida did because Florida set a precedence of how to react as a legislative body to things contractually within the insurance industry, such as the assignment of benefits. And remember, I've been very involved with the assignment of benefits in Florida, going to Tallahassee, doing other things in the background to just make sure that I was very, very aware of the changes that were being made. And granted, the bill in Florida is horrible. It's absolutely horrible. And it's made things worse. But at the end of the day, that's my fear for other states. I don't care about attorneys collecting. I don't care if they make a million dollars. I don't care if they make a dollar. Anywhere in between is fair. Yeah. The point okay. is, is the degradation of that process I got for I got it. And, other and, states. And here's the deal. <laughs> the legislators in Florida had a serious problem to look at because they had lawyers filing tens of thousands of lawsuits. The reason they were filing tens of thousands of lawsuits is because of a very liberal attorney fee shifting statute that doesn't exist anywhere else. So I think those are uh, those are extraordinary circumstances. And I want I want to respond to what these people are are saying on uh, on the comments here because I think it's important. They want to know uh, what the problems are with AOBs. You mentioned it being uh, a blank check that that restorers would charge what they want to charge. Well, can't if 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 a restorer is inclined to overcharge on a job, will the lack of an AOB keep them from doing that? What well, what's the difference in overcharging between an AOB and no AOB? They want to gouge, they're just going to gouge. They don't need an AOB to gouge. Will you agree? I would agree. Okay. And so I want to respond to Josh Foote. He says, I still haven't heard a direct answer. Are you saying AOBs shouldn't be used by anyone because some contractors are bad? No, I'm saying that I think that as a industry, if we want to use the AOB responsibly, then we should put some safeguards in place in order to make sure that those individuals who are not going to use it respectfully are separated from those of us who would use it respectfully if you choose to use mm-hmm. so. I, I don't have any Good. say whether or not you use and, or not. And, use and it. tell me, tell me what your number one choice would be for the the safeguards. The the industry is li- listening right now. We want to know what safeguard do you think needs to be put in place. As I mentioned to you, probably be a three pronged approach, which would be a group of industry peers and professionals, both from within the RIA and maybe from outside of the RIA, because that would probably be good to have outsiders' opinions, creating a standard, if you will, for what the proper use, and it doesn't have to be big, doesn't have to be long. It could be one day, it could be two days, but whatever that committee determines that it needs to be, whatever my peers determine it needs to be, step one, creating a committee and creating the steps. Step two would be to put together a process and get that in line. And step three would then be rolling out in the use of the assignment of benefits for those of those people who are trained to use it. Two years ago, the restoration industry formed the Advocacy and Government Affairs Committee. And we have worked very intensively on these issues following the collection of feedback from thousands of restoration contractors. And our committee has, in fact, been working on this. We have 
uh, representatives on the committee from companies large and small from all different uh, regions across the country. As a matter of fact, we spent over an hour just today uh, working on this exact issue. So I want to uh, extend uh, an assurance uh, on our behalf that we are taking this seriously and we want feedback from you. We want feedback from everybody who is listening to, to let us know what should and should not be in an assignment of benefits. And if contractors are going to overcharge, well, the assignment of benefits is not carte blanche for them to do that. And they should not be gouging any more than an insurance company uh, should be lowballing. And so uh, in the interest of unity, the RIA has, has reached out to everyone. It's the oldest, largest, best funded uh, association in the, the restoration industry. And um, we hope that everybody will come to the, uh, the convention so we can continue this dialogue. I want to thank you for uh, talking with me today. And I hope you and I can uh, continue the conversation. Okay. Oh, we're done. You, you want to have a closing comment? How about it? I don't have a closing comment. I mean, you and I had a much better conversation last night where it feel like everything I was saying, we definitely had, you were obviously in agreement, obviously you took notes and you made a very good opening statement touching on a lot of the things that we discussed last Thank night. You. I, appreciate I respect that. that. Um, you know, I see some comments in here, which are interesting to say the least, you know, I apologize if I interrupted you. Obviously I got interrupted a few times, so I think it was you a did. two way road. I apologize. Um, yeah. You know, I don't mean to interrupt you, but I want to make sure we touch on certain topics before we move forward, because obviously we don't have opportunities to touch. You know, in the beginning, you've mentioned so many different points that we didn't even touch on today. Um, and the only thing that I was really asked are what do I think was essentially the, the, the ways that contractors take advantage of this whole situation, which I don't think that majority of contractors try to take advantage of situations. I think like we discussed last night, which we were in complete agreement, is, is the fact that it doesn't matter how good 10% of us are. There's the other 90% and they could ruin this for everybody. And just like it was ruined in Florida, it wasn't the 10% of good people. It was the 90% of bad people. And that fear of having the overwhelming majority of our industry misusing an AOB simply because a group like ourselves or yourselves, I mean, listen, if we go out and say that this is the best thing to use, a lot of people are going to start using it. It's the same thing yeah. with your organization. If you say that this is the best thing to use, a lot of people are going to listen to this and they're going to take that advice and they're going to start to use it. Yeah. All I would say is that the proper steps need to be put in place. It's a great tool. It really is. Unfortunately, we're in a place in our industry where this tool has been misused so many times in one specific state. And unfortunately, the precedent has been set and it's very much so a public thing. And I know and I know that there are better ways and other ways for us to make sure as contractors that we look out for our own best interest. I don't want anybody not getting paid. I don't want anybody being shorted by their customers. I don't want to see anybody tell me those stories because at the end of the day, those are the challenges that we all face. And right. that's disgusting. But we have to safeguard the decisions we make. And I think as an industry... And I'll ask you, how many people on this group that you're talking about with the AOB aren't a part of the RIA? Because I'm sure that there's some outside professional opinions with lawyers and some other things like that and some other bodies that might be brought in. But how many restorers outside of the RIA have been brought into this discussion? Because today is the first time that I heard about it being released. Today's the first time I heard about a lot of these things. Yesterday, I heard about some of them. But I'm just an average restorer. So how does a guy like me get involved with a group like the RIA in order to make sure that we have a seat at the table? Because honestly, and I'm going to say this, and I'm not going to use the wrong terminology, but a lot of the industry feels like we're outsiders in a group and not welcome. And we all just want to be a part of the same organization. I mean, I've reached out to one of the top guys who in your organization who's a industry leader. And we're both restoration contractors. No private messages have been returned, no emails, no phone calls, no nothing. I had to join the be a member to, to have a discussion with you. And like, we need to have unity. Yeah, remember the message you sent me a while ago? Um, but either way, like, I'm fine with that, Ed. I'm willing to make the investment for conversations and for these bridges to be gap, you know, 
to be closed because the RAA, NORP, IICRC, SCRT, whoever it is, a Ramsco, I don't really care. Everybody who's trying to help the restoration contractor, whether it be you or some other lawyer on the East Coast of the United States, we should all be able to help build up the industry and we should stop being so, we talk about unity a lot, but there's not a lot of unity behind closed doors. And it's, it's, it's great to talk about things, but the one thing that I've made a benchmark of NORP is if we're going to talk about it, we're going to do it. And it doesn't matter if people yeah. like me at the end of the day, I'm going to be the fighter for the industry and the rest of the people, because not everybody has a voice and people need a voice. Yeah. I don't mind being that voice, but we need to be able to work with individuals like yourself and groups like the RA who are so powerful and have so much clout within the organization in the industry because you've been around for 75 years no matter what phase of the organization it was or what stage of life they were in fact is is that it happened no one can take that away from anybody but moving forward those individuals have to be more open to the rest of us coming in and accepting us as restoration professionals those things on the wall don't mean anything to many people but to a few of us, they mean a lot. And I hope to one day get the credentials from the RIA. We want to help push RIA training, but we need to work together. And if we basically just shy an eye, it's an idea like putting, I mean, it's unfortunate that you definitely looked at my opinion as, well, this won't really happen type of a thing. And it's unfortunate because I'm not asking that you don't do something. I'm simply asking that we put a little bit more attention into something that could be so great because it does have that potential. It really does have that potential. And I've just seen it be done wrong before. And I don't want to see you guys walk down that path. I don't have all the answers by any means, but I'm definitely concerned. I'm one concerned bystander. I'm a restorer. I'm a member of the RIA. And as a member of the RIA now and a past member a long, long time ago, the only thing that I could ask you to do is just make sure that before we release something like this into the public, that we make sure that it's rock solid and impenetrable. That's it. Okay. What we're releasing to the public, uh, to RIA members, that is, is 400 pages of excerpts of the unique individual laws state by state regarding assignments of benefits and insurance bad faith. And it's up to awesome. the contractors to decide uh, what's good for them and whether it's suitable for them. In terms of the work that has gone into this, uh, I can understand that it may appear hasty to you, but I wanna assure you that I've been drafting assignments of benefits and dealing with these legal issues for 20 years now. Whitney, and, and I'm bringing this experience in together with the, the information and the reports I've gotten from literally thousands of restoration contractors in the couple of decades that I've been doing this. And as to your, your question about how people get involved, they simply go to restorationindustry.org. And there's all the resources on there. There's many, many different ways to get involved. You can buy a membership. There's, there's videos. We've got a treasure trove of valuable materials there. And we're trying to seek a level and fair playing field for contractors in the claim settlement process. And we're not here to pick fights with the insurance industry. We respect the insurance industry, but there's our, there are some adjusters who get too aggressive, just like there are some contractors who get too aggressive. And we are here to advocate for the best interests of the contractor to make sure they get a fair shake. We've been going for two hours now. I'm grateful for it's your time. It's a great time. topic, man. I, I, it is a great topic. I don't want to. Uh, I don't want to overdo this for our audience. So I'm going to uh, thank you and look forward to seeing you in Florida. Look forward to it. Okay. Bye bye.